right here, well, we can see the, the River Dove and it's meeting the River Trent. And this is, this kind of marks the start of our journey, the Uniting River. Because right there is the border between Derbyshire and Staffordshire. Now, I'm going to hand it over to Matthew Poynton, who will give us a historical perspective of this place. Matt, over to you. Yeah, so we're in a place called Newton Solney at the moment, and this would have been an important place uh, back in medieval times, because, of course, where two rivers meet was very important. In those days, people carried a lot of their goods by river, um, they did a lot of their their lives they would have been washing here in the river and that and of course as you can see this is quite quite a big river this is the Trent here that's the dove over there quite a big river at this point point. Um, so they could have sailed boats along it and you would have seen boats sailing past and there is a very uh, famous legend from these parts uh, about um, this bit of the river so uh, there was down in Burton on Trent which is that way there was a saint called Saint Modwin she was a lady and she lived on an island uh, in Burton on Trent and up that way there was another saint and his name was Saint Hardolf and he lived in a cave and they used to meet to um, discuss like holy gospels and lives of saints and stuff and then one day he came down and realised he'd forgotten his book that they were going to talk about so Saint Modwin sent one of her kind of disciples up the river in a boat so they went up here in a boat to uh, get the book and then what happened is there was a storm and the boat was capsized and it sank to the bottom. Uh, but, and the, 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 uh, the, well, the disciples were trapped in the boat, like on the bottom of the river. Now, St. Modwin in a vision heard what had happened. And so what she did is a bit like Moses. She held up her hands and the waters parted of the river. And then she and St. Hardolf walked up the river bank with the water on either side to this boat where these girls were trapped inside and then he tried to flip the boat over but he couldn't do it uh, and so she prayed to God again and she flipped the boat over so it was kind of girl power in an early day and that was one of St Modwin's earliest miracles so there we are here we are at Newton Solney Right, so yeah, as Thomas said, we're in Burton on Trent now, and actually on an island in the middle of the Trent, so it splits in two parts, the biggest part over there, that's the border for Staffordshire and Derbyshire, and this smaller part, uh, we're all in Staffordshire here, and this island's called Andrisse, and do you remember I talked about St Modwin before? Yeah, well this is where she lived, she had a place on here uh, with her disciples and doing all her holy stuff and uh, some people might know the name St Modwin because um, it, it's the name of a housing development company and their symbol is the swan and there are loads of Modwin swans on the river today and um, after uh, St Modwin died uh, they grew up with a bit of a cult around her and they built a huge abbey here and the abbey was actually on the spot of the church over there you can see that church it's St Modwin's church much newer the churches and the the monks in the abbey were the people who brewed beer and their brewed beer was very good and so it continued they say the water here is particularly good for beer and so over the years Burton became the brewing capital of Britain so you might have heard of Bass, Worthington, Marston's all those famous beers they all come come from here and even today they still brew a, a lot of beer here so yeah it's a, it's a great place great place to go for a drink if you're into that um, 
and it made Burton one of the biggest towns in Staffordshire. Burton's about 150,000 people today. And during the railway age, other industries came. Um, so one of the byproducts was um, yeast from the brewing industry. So they make marmite with that. Uh, and another famous project product from here is just down the road. There's a village called Brampton, and they make Brampton pickle. Um, so lots of things, lots of manufacture here. This is Burton, a town that only exists because of the river trend. And um, this is the Rudley power station. Now, a lot of you will be coming here maybe thinking, oh, I want to see the, the pretty stuff. Well, if it wasn't for this power station, a lot of the pretty stuff wouldn't be here. This is probably what provides Rudley with most of its economic support. And in my opinion, I think it's the heart of this area. So. Um, that's it for me. I'm going to hand it over to Matt, who's going to uh, uh, talk to you about the train station just over there. Over to you, Matt. Yeah, so we're in Rugeley. There's the power station, as Tom said. But I'm more interested uh, in this here. By the river, we have this railway line. And rivers have always been a means of communication because they carve out these flat valleys, right? So when... Um, technology improved uh, obviously the romans would build their roads often uh, following um rivers and then later came the canals we're going to be talking about canals in a bit but after the canals came the railways and this is probably the most important railway line in the country this is the railway that links london with uh, well birmingham if you go that way but also all the way up to manchester and scotland it's called the west coast main line it's four tracks wide it's built by um i don't know which company originally it might be the london and birmingham company but it became part of the london and northwestern railway which prior to 1922 was the largest railway company uh, in britain headquartered in crew where they made all their, their uh, locomotives and stuff and even today it's so busy lots of freight lots of passengers there's half hourly trains each way to london and of course even that even those four tracks and it's so busy uh, is not enough and they are now planning to build down this valley somewhere um hs2 which will be the bullet train of the future so this is staffordshire's past it's the present but it's also the future Haywood right now and um, this is important because this is where the river Sal meets the river Trent and a uh, fun fact when two rivers meet it's called a confluence so uh, try and impress your teachers there but um, these are the two most important rivers in all of uh, Staffordshire and um, another fun fact is the river Sal is kind of what gives Staffordshire, or Stafford, its name. Um, Sal, it should be called 
um, Stalford, I think, and um, it's been like sort of like Chinese whispers. It's changed um, to Stafford. Now I'm going to leave it over to Matt, who's going to uh, give us a, maybe a bit more information. So over to you, Matt. Yeah, Great Haywood's quite an important place, really, because of what's going on over there. Now, you can't see it because it's behind some trees, but there's a huge uh, stately home there called Shugborough Hall, which is the home of Lord Litchfield, but it's also one of the most popular places to visit in the county. It's really beautiful, it's got some great grounds, and it's got a, a farm with wild breed uh, animals in it. Um, as Thomas said, this is where the two rivers meet. This is the confluence between the south, uh, of, uh, which goes through Stafford and off in that direction. Uh, there's also joined by the Penk, uh, where we get the name Penkridge from, another uh, famous local place. Um, but over there, in just over that bridge there, is something else. That's the canal. So we're going to go and have a look at that now. Let's have a look. Yeah, we're only a few metres away now from the river where we were before, it's just over there. And this is not a river, this is a canal. It's the Trenton Mersey Canal, which is probably uh, the premier canal in the country. And it's part of what was called the, the Silver Cross. So the uh, James Brindley, the engineer, he envisaged this cross of waterways uh, through, the, through the Midlands. Uh, to, which would link the four main rivers of Britain, so the Trent, the Mersey, the Severn and the Thames, and, the, and this forms the kind of top two arms of it. And um, this was built in the 1770s, so it was a premier waterway uh, in Britain at the time, and it helped carry goods, manufactured goods, from the English industrial midlands to the, to the ports, where they could then be exported all around the world. And of course, um, it, it was very successful for a while, but then it was replaced by the railway, and you can just see through the trees the railway runs next to the canal there. That's the one we saw earlier. So, um, Thomas, I mean, canals, have you got any experience on canals? Have you ever been on a canal boat? Well, um, another thing, I actually live right by a canal. I live in an area of Staffordshire called Etruria. You may have heard of Wedgwood Pottery. Well, um, I live like right by there and um, almost every day I love to just grab my bike and travel along the canal, look at the water, it's quite satisfying and it's just lovely and I always like ride up to Westport Lake. Yeah, actually, West, uh, Wedgwood's Pottery Factory, which is now gone, and that's across the road from where you live, uh, was the largest pottery factory in the world when it was built, on this canal, the Trent and Mersey, and um, it, was, it was a wonder of its day, um, and it helped make Staffordshire potteries famous across the globe. Um, it's quite sad that there's nothing left except one circular building, which we won't be seeing on this trip because this is about the river and actually the river's veered away by that point. Uh, have you ever been on a canal boat? Yes, uh, my uncle, he uh, owns a canal boat. He's, um, I think he had one for, to help with his art. Um, his art, uh, you may know him, Rob Pointy. And um, when I was younger, I once dressed up as a pirate, and I, I once went on his canal boat and started shouting, Ahoy there! to all the, the people walking their dogs. Okay, so no, no more fun than messing about on boats. There we are, the Trent and Mersey Canal.
in a place called Stone and uh, right on the River Trent as you can see there's these sort of white uh, poles I think well um, these are for the canoeing club just over there and um, Stone is a very pretty place lots of parks nice restaurants and shops but um, I'm gonna give it over to Matt who's going to tell you a little story about this place over to you Matt yeah, so Stone has uh, quite an interesting, I don't know if it's history or maybe it's just legend behind it. And the name Stone comes from a stone placed by uh, Queen Ermenhilda and she was the wife of Wulfhere. Now, who are these people? Well, Wulfhere was an early king of Mercia. And we, you may remember we mentioned Mercia earlier um, because um, Repton, uh, near to where the uh, the confluence of the Trent and the Dove was once a capital of Mercia. But there's been several capitals of Mercia. One was Tamworth, which we went quite near earlier, and another uh, is there, and it was a hill fort. We can't actually see it, but it overlooks the Trent. And, and King Wolf Harry had his fortress there, and he was a, uh, he was a pagan king. He was the last pagan king in the area, and he had two sons, and their names were Wolfhard and Rufin. Now, their mum, Ermenhilda, was actually Christian. She was the daughter of a Christian king of East Anglia, but um, he was pagan and his sons were brought up pagan. And they went out riding. They went along the Trent Valley, perhaps, perhaps past here in the days when it was all woods and swamp lands, and they, they found a cave, which is in a place called Salt. The cave still exists. And in the cave, there was a hermit, and his name was Chad. He later became Saint Chad, the first bishop of Lichfield and he taught them about Christianity and they converted in secret. Now, they had a sister and her name was Werberg and she was meant to be very beautiful. Uh, and she was also a Christian because she followed her mum, but uh, because she was a Christian, she wanted to become a nun. Uh, but because she was very beautiful, uh, a lot of men wanted to marry her. And um, one of them was uh, Wolf Harry's number one like, kind of warrior, a guy called Werbode. And he wanted to marry Werberg. And he asked Wolf Harry, can I marry your daughter? And the king said, well, if she agrees, yes. So um, he went to her and asked, and she said no, because she wanted to become a nun. Uh, and he was so angry, he, he'd overheard that the two sons uh, had converted to Christianity. And he was so angry with Werberg and with the church, which he'd seen had taken her off him, that he told Wolf Harry that his sons had converted. And Wolf Harry was so angry, he was quite an angry man, he chased his sons and killed them. And then the moment he did that, he regretted what he'd done and, um, and converted and became Christian, which is why this area is Christian. But interestingly, um, Ermenhilda, what she did, she was so upset at the death of her children that she lay a stone on the place where uh, Wolfhard was murdered by his dad, and that stone became the town stone. And it was where that church is over there. That's the church of St. Wolfhard. And there was once an abbey there dedicated to him. So that is the story of stone. Yeah, so Thomas, you see that um, hill ahead there? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's actually, that was the hill fort uh, well, where Wolf Harry and Wolfhard and Rufin and Ermanilda lived. Ah. So that's the second capital of Mercy we've seen today. Yeah, there's not a lot to see these days. I am right here at Trenton Gardens, um, one of Staffordshire's most visited attractions. And uh, these gardens used to belong to uh, Trenton Hall, which um, I think belonged to the Duke and Duchess of Devonshire. And um, 
not a lot of the hole is left, quite a lot collapsed due to mining tubs and pinches. And so um, I'm going to bring it over to Matt and he will tell us a bit more in that historical perspective. Go. Yeah, so Trentham Gardens are um, what's left, basically. These are the Italian gardens here, very famous. What's left of the Trentham Estate. And, and there's not much of the hall there. And this brings us into a, a, another theme because actually the hall collapsed because of coal mining under, underground. And we're now moving into the Stoke-on-Trent area. And so one of the two reasons why Stoke-on-Trent became the great city that it is today is coal mining. So it was a big mining area all the way around the valley of the Trent. Um, the other was, of course, pottery, which we've talked about, which they were able to carry away safely to the ports because of the canal that was built, as we talked about before. However, what I want to talk about here is why is Trentham Hall here in the first place? Well, it was here because um, after the Reformation, um, the land was given to one of the nobles that supported Henry VIII. Uh, and of course, before that, it was um, an abbey. It was monastery land, church land. And why was there an abbey here? Because I don't know if you remember back with our Wolford and Rufin story, but their sister, the very pretty one who uh, didn't want to marry Werbode, was Werberg. And Werberg later grew up, she became an abbess, uh, she actually became a saint, um, and she set up a number of abbeys and monasteries, and this was one of them. And it is said that uh, she died here, uh, on the site of Trentham Church, which we can't see, but it's just behind the hall there. And um, she died here, but she didn't want to die here, she wanted to die uh, somewhere else, near the River Dove. Um, in the east of the county and so in the middle of the night the people uh, from Hanbury where she wanted to die came over sneaked in and she magically unlocked all the doors for them and then carried her body away so there we are this is Trenton Yeah, so we're entering the city of Stoke-on-Trent now, which of course the, the river gives its name to. The river's down there, I don't know if you can see it, it's, it's in a bit of a hole, but it's down there. But it, the river's really hard to find in Stoke-on-Trent, and um, it actually runs underground for a bit here, under some of these uh, roads. So that's the old football ground there, it, it, it runs next to that, and then it runs alongside this road in a concrete channel and we can see that in a second so if we have a look on the opposite side of the road can you see that concrete thomas where it's got like kind of swirly lines that look like water oh yes that's the river trent there i think that must be the sorriest section of the river trent there that there is where it's running in a concrete hole wow yeah from being a once great river to a little stream. Yeah. It'll get smaller yet. So let, let's have a look at it. So we are right here in uh, Stoke. Um, Stoke-on-Trent to be precise. And this, this is where Stoke-on-Trent gets its name due to the River Trent. Now... It's quite hard to find the River Trent here. We were searching for ages just to find a decent spot. And like, this is as great as we're gonna get. As you can see, it's got a load smaller. Um, yeah, uh, it's over to you, Matt. Yeah, Thomas, I mean, the River Trent is famously hard to find in Stoke-on-Trent. There is a, a local folk song called Where's the Hell's the Trent, which is, the uh, the singer jokes about he's been all around the world to these famous sites, but he can't find the Trent in Stoke-on-Trent, which is quite funny. Um, but the city is named after, after the river, and in many ways it did have a part in its founding, uh, providing water for some of the earliest uh, pot banks, which are the pottery factories, which made its name, of course, along with the mining, which we made earlier. Uh, stoke on trent's the biggest city in Staffordshire by a mile. It's about a quarter of a million people, and it's actually a really unusual city because it's not um, one city, but it's um, six towns, 
fuse together to make a city. And I think we're in the town of Stoke, which is one of the six towns, which makes it even more com confusing. Uh, the centre is Hamley, which is just over there. And then there's Longton, Burslem, Tunstall and Fenton. So, yes, this is the Trent in Stoke-on-Trent. I'm right here at Nipersley Reservoir at a beautiful lake as you can see. Now, this is like the, the heart of the River Trent, or the heart of, as we like to call it, the Uniting River. And um, it's quite a beautiful lake, you can see it's getting much more hillier now. And um, a lot of people like to come here and take nice walks, it's very beautiful. Numerous amounts of times that I've walked around here myself. Um, I'm going to hand it over to Matt, he's going to give us more of a historical perspective. Yes Thomas, you're right, it is a beautiful spot isn't it? And um, the, the Trent's really different now, remember we started off with that really wide river that you could actually sail a boat down, now it's nothing more than a stream, although of course here it's big because it's been dammed and we're standing on the dam now, uh, built at the end of the 18th century I think, I think, uh, because it was part of the um, succession of reservoirs created to feed the Trent and Mersey Canal. So remember that canal we saw earlier, it's got to get its water from somewhere, so what they did is they dammed streams and rivers up in the hills to create these reservoirs and then they diverted that water off. So <clears throat> down, just down there, if you walk down about a mile, uh, a, a small stream splits off and that goes into the canal to give the canal its water. Um, the other bit of history here is, of course, there was a, a, a stately home around here, Nipersley Hall. And if you do walk around uh, Nipersley Pools, uh, you can see there's, we can just about see the top of it, there's, there's a, a, a tower in there, a folly, and that was part of the stately home. And um, at the bottom is a bridge, and that's where the Trent goes off right to its very source. The source is called the head of the Trent, where it comes out of the ground. So shall we have a take a look at that? Well, we have now come to the end of our great journey the Uniting River. This right here is where the River Trent starts. Look at it, it's a tiny little stream. To think this would become a massive, great river even ships can travel upon. Well, um, I hope you enjoyed our journey and learnt many things just as much as I did on our great Uniting River trip. Oh,